Here I've got a nice problem from a Polish-Austrian math contest from 1983. And one thing that I like about this problem is it mixes addition with prime numbers. And the definition of a prime number is really rooted in the notion of multiplication. So anytime you have addition combined with prime numbers, it's gonna be a little bit tricky. Okay, so let's see the statement of this problem. So we want to suppose we've got natural numbers p, q, and n, where p and q are primes, and they satisfy the following equation. So p times p plus 1 plus q times q plus 1 equals n times n plus 1. And our goal is to find all triples p, q, and n that make this equation satisfied. Okay, before we get started, I want to recall the standard formula for a triangular number. And that is 1 plus 2 plus 3 up to k is equal to k times k plus 1 over 2. And so notice that these objects are really related to triangular numbers. By triangular numbers, I mean the sum of the first k integers, or natural numbers, I should say. Okay, so first off, I'm going to start by making the assumption that p is bigger than or equal to q. And so we can make that assumption without loss of generality. And that's because P and Q are playing symmetric roles here. So any solution we get with P being bigger than Q will also have a solution where Q is bigger than P. We'll have just a symmetric solution. And next I want to make an observation about the size of N with respect to P and Q. So notice by our assumption, we have Q is less than or equal to P, but notice that P is strictly less than N. That means that P and Q are both less than N. That's pretty obvious by this structure over here. But then N is less than P plus Q plus 1. And that part of the inequality actually requires a little bit of calculation. So let's suppose not. So let's suppose that n is bigger than or equal to p plus q plus 1 and see what goes wrong. Well, let's notice that n times n plus 1, which is the right-hand side, right, which is the right-hand side of this equation, is equal to 2 times 1 plus 2 all the way up to n by this closed form for the nth triangular number. But now since n is bigger than or equal to p plus q plus 1, we can see that this is strictly less than 2 times 1 plus 2 up to p plus 1 plus 2 up to q. But now we can put these two triangular numbers together using our formula over here to get p times p plus 1 plus q times q plus 1. So you see we have the right-hand side of our equation is strictly bigger than the left-hand side, so that means this is impossible. We've reached a contradiction just reading from here through to here. So what did we contradict? We contradicted the ability for n to be bigger than or equal to p plus q plus 1 which means n must be less than p plus q plus 1. So that finishes our argument that n has to go in this range. Okay, now that we've gotten that taken care of, let's maybe get rid of this and we'll jump into the bulk of our solution. So we just got done bounding n between two expressions involving p and q. Now we're ready to jump into the rest of our solution. So let's take our blue boxed equation over here and rewrite it a little bit. So let's solve for the p times p plus 1 term. So notice that's going to be the same thing as n squared plus n minus q squared minus q. But now we notice if n were equal to q, this side would cancel. Obviously, n cannot be equal to q, but that gives us some motivation that we should be able to factor n minus q out of this right-hand side. And we can, and we'll be left with n plus q plus 1. Okay, great. Well, so now let's notice that P most definitely divides the left-hand side of this equation. This left-hand side is a multiple of P. That means P divides the right-hand side of the equation. But notice that the right-hand side of the equation is made up of a product of two things. And there's a standard result from number theory 
that says if p divides a times b, then p divides a or p divides b. And so we're gonna use that on this green and red underlined thing. So let's look at our first case, which is when p would divide that green underlined thing. So I'm just gonna write that as p divides n minus q like this. Okay, well, let's notice that by the definition of divisibility, that means n minus q is equal to mp. But then that means that we can write n as q plus mp. But now let's also notice that if p divides this green thing, then that means this red thing must divide p plus 1. So let's uh, write that down here. We've got n plus q plus 1 must divide p plus 1. So that's some sort of like dual relationship between divisibility happening on either side of the equation. But now let's take this version of n and plug it into this divisibility relationship right here. What is that going to give us? That means we have mp plus 2q plus 1 divides p plus 1. But that's a bit of a problem. Notice that that is impossible because we have mp plus 2q plus 1 is strictly bigger than p plus 1 because m cannot be zero. And since m is not zero, well then obviously this thing is bigger than this thing, but you can't have something larger dividing something that is smaller when they're both natural numbers. So what does that mean? That means this case one is impossible, which means we can't have divisibility of p with this thing, which is underlined in green, which means we have to have divisibility of p which, with this thing, which is underlined in red. And that's what we're going to take as we move on to the next step. Okay, where are we so far? Well, we determined that p must divide n plus q plus 1, which means n minus q must divide p plus 1. But let's move off of this. This p divides n plus q plus 1. That tells us that n plus q plus 1 must be equal to m times p for some m, which is a natural number. Now we've got to figure out what are the possible values that m can take, and we can do that using our inequality up here that we began our solution with. So I'm going to rewrite this. We have mp is equal to n plus q plus 1, which is strictly less than p plus q plus 1 plus q plus 1, where I've replaced n with this guy up here that depends on p and q by the inequality that we argued before. But next, let's also take the fact that p is bigger than or equal to q to replace these q's with p and see that this is less than or equal to 3p plus 2. Okay. So now let's notice that mp is less than or equal to 3p plus 2, which tells us that m must come from the set 1, 2, or 3. Notice we can't have 4p be less than or equal to 3p plus 2 when p is a prime. Okay, so that means we're left with three subcases. The subcase when m is equal to 1, m is equal to 2, and m is equal to 3. Okay, so let's maybe get rid of all of this and we'll attack each of those last subcases. So let's recall where we were. We had this equation p times p plus 1 is equal to n minus q times n plus q plus 1. The next, we determined that n plus q plus 1 was a multiple of p, but the value of the multiple of p could only be 1, 2, or 3. Now we're going to look at each of those possibilities to finish this off. So our first possibility will be m equals 1. So let's notice if m equals 1, this blue equation takes the following form. And this blue equation is extremely important as we finish this off. So we've got p times p plus 1 equals n minus q times p. 
Again, because m is equal to one, and as we noted, this was a multiple of p. Okay, but now we can just cancel this p from both sides, and that gives us p plus one equals n minus q, like that. Or that's the same thing as writing n as p plus q plus one. So let's notice we've got two equations that relate n, p, and q. We have this n equals p plus q plus one, which came from this. And then we also have this n plus q plus one is equal to p. And that comes from taking this m equals one. So let's write that down. So n plus q plus one equals p. Now we wanna fuse those two equations together and show that that is problematic. So let's put these together. I'll do that by plugging this value for n into our second equation. Notice that's gonna give us p plus q plus one plus q plus one equals p. Now let's do some simplification here. So notice that we can cancel a p from both sides and then we're left with 2q plus 2 is equal to 0. But lo let's see, notice that that is impossible if q is a prime number, because q can't be minus 1 as, well, not only is it prime, but it's a natural number. Okay, great. So now let's move on to subcase 2, which is taking the second possible value for m, and that value will be m equals 2. Okay, so if we take m equals 2, what happens to the blue equation? We have p times p plus 1 is equal to n minus q times 2p. Well, we can still cancel the p from both sides of the equation like that, and then we're left with p plus 1 is equal to 2n minus 2q. Okay. But then that means that p is equal to 2n minus 2q minus 1, just by moving that stuff around. Okay. Now what should we do? Well, now we'll recall that this equation right here has a parallel version in our new case, which is n plus q plus one equals two times p. So how can we fuse these two together? Well, maybe we'll multiply this equation by two. If we multiply this equation by two, we get two p equals four n minus four q minus two. So now we can set this thing which is underlined in blue equal to this thing which is underlined in blue. And maybe we've got a good place to go from there. So let's see, we've got 4n minus 4q minus two is equal to n plus q plus one. But now we can take this equation and rearrange it a little bit. So I'm gonna move all of the terms involving q to one side of the equation and everything else to the other side of the equation. So moving this 4q over, we'll see that we have 5q is equal to, moving this n over, we will have 3n minus 3. I can write that as 3 times n minus 1. But let's notice that the right-hand side of this equation is clearly a multiple of 3. That tells us that the left-hand side is also a multiple of 3. But since 5 and 3 are relatively prime, that means q has to be a multiple of 3, but q is prime, so that tells us that q must in fact be equal to 3. Okay, so now where can we go from there? Well, if q is equal to 3, then we see that n minus 1 is equal to 5, but if n minus 1 is equal to 5, that tells us that n equals 6. Then if we plug q equals 3 and n equals 6 into this equation right here, what do we get? Well, we get 6 plus 3 plus 1, which is 10, equals 2 times p, but that means p is equal to 5. 
So there we get a nice solution where P is equal to five, Q is equal to three, and N is equal to six. So since we're assuming that P is bigger than or equal to Q here, we get a symmetric solution where P is three, Q is five, and N is six. Okay, so that's good. We've got two solutions and one case left to check. That case when M is equal to three. So let's maybe finish it all off. So we're ready for our last subcase. And that's the case when m is equal to 3. So just to review where we are, when m was equal to 1 in this equation, we had no solution. When m was equal to 2, we got these two symmetric solutions. Now we're ready to check the last possibility, which is m equals 3. So just as in the last cases, we'll get two equations out of this. We'll get the equation right here where we replace m with 3. So we'll have p times p plus 1 equals n minus q times 3p. And we'll get the equation right here where we replace m with 3. So that'll be n plus q plus 1 is equal to 3 times p. Like that. Okay, well now let's do a little bit of simplification. Just as we did before, we can cancel this P right here with this P right here. And then we'll be left with P plus one equals three N minus three Q. So I wanna start by solving that for P. That'll give me P equals three N minus three Q minus one. And then we'll multiply this equation by three so that we've solved for three P and thus it will interact with our first equation or our second equation a little bit easier. So let's see what we get if we do that. So this yellow arrow will be multiplied by three. So I'm gonna write it in kind of the symmetric order. So I'll put my three P over there. And on this side, I will have nine N minus nine Q minus three. Okay, and now I'm going to combine these two equations. So I'll multiply this first one by a minus sign, and then I will add them. So that'll give me 3p minus 3p, that is 0. Then I have negative 3 minus 1. Well, that's going to be equal to negative 4. Then I have minus 9q minus q, that's going to give me minus 10q. Then 9n minus n, that's going to give me 8n. Then since Q is prime, I probably want to rearrange this so I'm solving for Q or something close to Q. So let's do that. So that'll give me 10Q is equal to 8N minus 4. Everything here is even. So that means I can divide everything by 2. That will give me 5Q equals 4N minus 2, which is equal to 2 times 2n minus 1. And that's actually really a powerful observation because notice this right hand side is even. But if that right hand side is even, that means that the left hand side is also even. 5 is not even. That tells us that q is even, but there's only one even prime and that is 2. So that means we have q equals 2. And now we can start plugging back into our previous equations to get the values of P and N. So plugging Q back here, we'll see that we have 20 equals 8N minus 4, which means N is equal to 3. Then plugging each of these maybe back up here or really into a bunch of different equations that are on the board, we'll see that P is also equal to 2. So that means we only get one new solution because P and Q are the same. So our last solution is two, two, three. So in the end, we have three total solutions and that's a good place to stop.